Good morning, Justin. Thank you ever so much for coming to chat to me on the Insurance Brokers podcast. It's fabulous to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Especially on such a sunny, not so sunny end of October, Friday morning. Yeah, it's got to cheer up a little bit. So I've got golf later. Well, there's a win. I don't, but I suspect I've got Prosecco, so we're good. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, Justin, um, I would love to hear a little bit about your background, how you came to be at TNR Direct, and yeah, your journey, your insurance journey, which I'm sure started with a conscious decision to join the insurance industry. <laughs> yeah, I think it was that. Maybe not, but I think it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's been a it's been a strange thirty plus years in insurance, as, as with everything else. Um, I don't think anybody starts out to work in insurance. It's you fall into it or stumble into it when you're drunk one day or someone says, come and work for me. And you don't know what you're getting yourself into. And um, next thing is you've spent 30 years doing it. Um, luckily, I started when or before computers. Um, not that they're a bad thing. They're a really good thing. But it co- taught me a valuable lesson. I worked for a broker called Bennett's many years ago. And uh, one thing that I loved about them was that they trained you well. They, rather than having computers, you had to use guides and rule calculator rules and all these type of things. And it gave you, or gave me a a terrific grounding. And uh, the beauty is with Bennett's is that a lot of the people that I used to work with still work there. And not work there, sorry, but I know of the people that used to work there and they've all been very successful. So that's fantastic. Moving on from there, I, I started in a lowly position as an office junior just because I walked through the door begging for a job because my parents were trying to kick me out of the house but I didn't get a job. Um, and uh, spent about 10 years there, starting off as junior, went to manager uh, within that period of time, which was a bit slow, but you know, at the end of the day, you've got to work your way up. Um, went from there to a few more brokers. Just I'm very loyal to companies. I don't like... Um, you know, if you, if you set yourself a goal to, stay, to go and join someone, at least give it a go and give it a try. The problem is you do then get the, the colour blood in your system. So their colour, Bennett's colour was blue and white. So I, I'm sure I had blue and white blood in my system for many years after I left. Um, then I went, say I went to another brokers, then went to a company called Stride Limited, who again, worked with some terrific people there, learned an awful lot. Um, Started as an office manager, went to an area manager, then to operations manager, then to strategy and product manager, which is all related within reason. Um, And then uh, decided that I wanted a new challenge after spending about 20 years there. So um, uh, I met a guy whilst I was working at Stride, because we used to work with him as part of a product suite we had, and um, a guy called Lee Taylor at TNR Direct, where I am now. And um, we had perfect synergy. We, everything we do, we complement each other. Um, it's very difficult to have that relationship with somebody. Um, I was offered other jobs at the time before I joined Lee, but there wasn't that same relationship or feeling that I had. And um, it's just been terrific. The last five years, I started five years ago, and the last five years have been, I don't know where they've gone. It's gone so quickly. We've had some great times, some awful times, some happy times, some sad times. Um, but throughout it, we've never wavered from our mission. Uh, we've got the same goals, the same outlook, the same hobbies. I'm better at golf than he is, which is always good. Um, and uh, underneath it all, we, the company runs brilliantly because he's got his attributes, I've got my attributes, and they come together really well, and we drive the company forward. So it's the age old thing, isn't there about every partnership should have, um, should have the opposite. So the um, sort of creative, uh, big idea, you know, push, push, push version, and then the person that kind of goes, hang on a minute, Let's just, let's do a bit of process. Let's do a bit of numbers. Let's think this through properly. And within our Absolutely. team here, we have the same. And I, um, I love that dynamic. Guess which one I am. You're the brains. <laughs> I'll take that. Which one are you? Um, well, Lee calls himself the fluffer. So he's the ideas man. 
even though I have ideas as well, but he is, he has some really radical ideas and I'm really the guy who gets it to market. Really. That's my speciality really. And um, together we work through everything. So in today's world, when there's FCA regulations, there's product regulations, there's every regulation under the sun that you can think of that we have embraced. It's, um, no, we just, again, it, we just work really well together. I mean, we're more of a schemes business, which is it's not unusual in the broken industry, but we don't, we don't sell car insurance as a product or any motor products because the market is saturated. Um, you've got massive players within the market that do some ridiculously cheap prices and the loss ratios are, are unbelievably poor. So we try and stay away from those type of markets. So just for example, we do submarine insurance, we do brass band insurance, we do tradesman insurance, specific trades um, on the retail, on the commercial side. On the retail, we generally just specialise in household, um, which is my background solely. And Lee specialises in property owners as well. So the synergy is there that we both know a lot about property, which is very good. But Absolutely. underneath underneath it all he is the bread he calls himself the fluffer so he goes in and does all the niceties and leads me to it um i'm more I've, I've turned myself into a really weird square individual um it's not the ideal scenario but that's what he says i am so i've changed full circle since i started insurance ah amazing what what the insurance industry can do for an insurance professional <laughs> <laughs> i think that might be the title of this uh, of this podcast um no no no, no. When we first, <laughs> <laughs> when we first started um, at Boston Tullis and we were setting up the company structure and the sort of job descriptions and that kind of stuff, I was pushing hard for the title CIO. I wanted to be Chief Ideas Officer. That wasn't allowed. <laughs> Chief Never mind. Eh? So that'd be my one. Uh, yeah, I mean that works for me too. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I'm quite interested with with you guys is you do quite a lot of business through uh the aggregators don't you how does we that do. work yeah um it takes a long time because again with aggregation or comparison sites i won't mention any because i don't want to do that but um we all know who they are the big ones and unless you you're a, a well-known product which we're not or a brand um it does take a bit of time to get on these um comparison sites um we've got in my previous life i had relationships with all of them but it's not been as easy because we gdpr came in uh, other regulations have come in they've had to close their doors which has caused delays for us getting on them as well since i've been with tnr direct um but what's what has happened since then is it transforms your life you can either embrace them and work with them or you can be scared and run away from them a lot of people uh, do run away from them because you can get really awful business from them. The loss ratios can be awful. Uh, you can get a lot of fraud via that route. Um, but if anybody wants you to go into using comparison sites, they've got to do their research. They've got to be able to know their target audience. They've got to have some sort of credit checking facility just to minimize the amount of fraud activity that will go on. Um, if they want to save their loss ratios and the biggest thing with insurance companies if your loss ratio goes uh, a bit north then um, they will stop the deal for you and it's as simple as that and it's a vicious world even though they're on the comparison sites as well and offering sometimes cheaper prices than we offer it is a bit of a uh, stupid situation but you, if you embrace them just to give you some sort of comparison we before I started with TNR, and it's no disrespect to what Lee was doing prior to me, um, he was doing probably 100, 200 new bids a month on household. Uh, and now we're doing over 2,000. So okay. it, it's, it gives you that facility to do it. Um, you, yeah, sorry. Do you track um, how many of those renew, whether they're quite pr yeah, promiscuous we, we business? Or... That as well. Yeah, the, the, the worst thing with comparison sites is that they do re-solicit their customers every year not via us but via themselves to say we've got a cheaper rate than last year or don't forget that we're here here's your here's, here's the current price that we offer um there's new people come into the market with ridiculous rates and we do lose business but we're pretty sharp on it 
I've got years of experience dealing with them. So if you're sharp and you've got great ideas and you keep that communication going with the customer, knowing that it's not the comparison site is their insurance broker, it's us. Because if anybody asked um, who they're insured with, just to throw it out there, the Meerkat, for example, they wouldn't know even though they're insured with. They'd just say, I'm insured by the Meerkat. So that's the, the main product. Whereas we are actually the people servicing their policy. Um, but the rewards are fantastic. If you, can, you don't make any money the first year because you do have uh, a cost per acquisition, which you know is part and parcel of using these people. But then you've got to balance it out to say, well, if I marketed it or do SEO or pay-per-click, would I still spend the same amount of money on a new business or would I spend less or would I spend more? Um, and as you know, we've not really done marketing or even ventured into marketing before to see if that does work. We're very nervous about it. Um, we have changed that philosophy now, which we can go on to later. But I think that the aggregation, just don't be afraid of it. You've got to embrace it. Can you give us an indication of what kind of cost per acquisition we're talking about? Um, it average. Yeah. It depends on the volume because there are brokers, believe it or not, that are doing hundreds of thousands of business a month on wow. there. And I think the more business you get, the cheaper the cost that they are going to charge you, but it can range anywhere between 50 and 60 pounds per policy. It's on, on the sale, not on the, on the lead or the quote, um, but they have other stipulations that you've got to have um, a sales floor. So anybody that clicks through to your website from that comparison site, uh, you have to try and convert it at quite a high level. And I would say that as long as you embrace it, if they click through and you've got good staff that if they allow you to call them because of GDPR, and you've got good staff that are quick to call them, generally conversion rates very good. But it's just getting that, put it this way, every month on, on property, we do in excess of about two and a half million quotes. We don't quote for all of those because our footprint that we go after is quite small compared with some others. So you might look at that and say, well, you only do 2,000 policies, which is probably 0.1%. But that's our, that's our profile, and that's what we're looking for. Not everybody will want to go for that. What kind of percentage of your business comes through the aggregators and what percentage is not? Yeah, about 60% comes via ags. Um, we're, very, we're very good at, um, on, on distribution channels, we have uh, our existing book, um, that historically hasn't come by aggregators. It, uh, the aggregators, is a, we've been established for nearly 25 years um, and we've re re retained most of that business, um, which is very good because it is niche, which is the benefit of it. Um, over the last five years, it's mainly the property or the home insurance side that's grown via the aggregators. Um, but we've consolidated our commercial book, we've grown it slightly, we've still got a huge amount of work to do in that department. But I think that overall, it's about 60% comes from ags, 10% uh, comes from our broker relationships, and the other business comes from uh, people coming back to us, us being proactive on lapses um, from, from the previous year, and just people who know us being referred back to us which is really good uh, it proves that our customer service works but the aggregators that's the other thing with the aggregators that people go generally on price but price isn't always the best route to go because if you go cheap the service is going to be poor um, if you go a bit more expensive people don't know us but if people did come to us and asked us questions they'll be very impressed rather than going to one of the big boys who really haven't got the time to speak to those people yeah so there's enough business there for everybody really at the end of the day because it's the way the world's gone i think it's really interesting because a lot of the people that i speak to on the podcasts but also clients or prospects or whatever um wow. we haven't really delved into um aggregators and, and 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 it's 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 a lead generation tool it's a form of marketing it's exactly yeah. you know the kind of conversations we're having so that's why i thought this would be really interesting because it's a slightly different um take on the discussions that i have and we've obviously had discussions around the other 40 percent and and yeah. different marketing techniques that uh, that you guys are looking at um 
what what are your thoughts coming from somebody that already has quite a cost per acquisition you know this is what i do to get my lead that is marketing what are your thoughts in terms of the 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 necessity of marketing on the other side of business um we've been rubbish at it and i think most most brokers our size either can't afford it they've got bigger things to spend their money on more important things to spend their money on but we at the beginning of this year before covid happened we really wanted to pursue uh, a marketing com company to try and help us develop our business further our existing book not the, the aggregator side but our existing book and find different ways to grow our niche business because there's plenty of that out there but we've been rubbish at trying to get more of it um most of our business new business that we get is word of mouth or referral similar thing but it's it's not been terrific and we've been pretty lousy at looking at marketing in a different light there's, there's, there's various types of marketing whether it's social media whether it's direct marketing email campaigns um leaflet drops all of these type of things um but we want to embrace it that's the big thing that we've, we've made a rule this year we want our aggregated business because that's already working we know how it works we keep a very close eye on it because it's very volatile um but with the marketing side we've got to start doing it we've got to look at how we can develop our existing book make it better tell our customers which is vital in today's fca world what other products we offer Absolutely. I think um, what's quite interesting in terms of conversations we've had previously is is your niche schemes and your uh, areas that you want to develop. And And I, I am a big advocate for focus. The more focused you can be in terms of who your target is, the more developed you can be in terms of what strategic uh, processes you put in place to, to bring that business in. So I, I obviously am an advocate of, of sales and marketing. And I thought I was reading something the other day. Um, I may have said this before, I don't know. Um, I think of sales uh, as um, sales and marketing as your prospect service. So if you think of customer service, what you would already do for your clients, giving them information, supporting them through their problems. And I think of sales and marketing as prospect service. So I quite like that idea. It is very good. I'm very similar to that, actually. I, it's an Americanism, I think, that you've got to look differently at different things um, and embrace everything. That's the You've embraced that idea. I, I quite like that idea. I've heard it in different guises, but it, it's, not a, it's not an issue. We shouldn't see any lead generation as a, a problem. You might not have enough staff to cope with it, but that's a good thing, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's the dream for every business, I would, I would suspect. Well, so it yeah. In terms of um, in terms of TNR's uh, growth objectives, um, have you set like the next five year plan? Has COVID interrupted? Yeah, we've had to all? reassess it, obviously, because um, a part of our niche book is we're heavily into pubs, restaurants, and areas of leisure as such as those, and that's been hit very badly. Um, the business interruption side of it hasn't helped our reputation, even though it's not our product, it's actually the insurer's product that has driven some business. We've, we've lost a considerable amount of business over the lockdown as a result of that. We are, they are starting to come back, which is fantastic. But we had, uh, I say, huge aspirations at the beginning of 2020, which we sort of knew uh, there was going to be a problem because I think at the end of 2019, COVID was already a word in the news. Um, we were worried about it, had various discussions, what we were going to do if it happens, which is great. Um, but it, we put the plans in motion and had to stop them come February. And it's almost like we've had to delay 2020 to 2021 now, which we're in the process of doing. Because obviously we are speaking to marketing firms. Um, we're looking to go on other aggregators, more niche aggregators, buying leads in as you would do. Um, but our biggest, our biggest growth area that we really want in 2021 is our commercial side, because there's it's an un we've untapped it basically. Our retail side, we specialise in household. It's fantastic. We're going to launch some new products for household, but that's just going to be almost like it's a guaranteed growth area for us. Um, whereas the commercial side, 
we've not let slip, that's the wrong word, but we haven't had enough focus on what the growth we wanted in it because the retail has taken up too much time. Now that's working well, we are four, four guns going to make 2021 our year for commercial. We want to double the size of it, which is quite a feat in its own. Uh, we're buying new staff. We've made huge staff changes internally where we've got champions of products uh, that make life easier for us. If someone's got a question, they can ask them rather than coming to me or Lee. Um, our staff has grown since I've been here from 10 to near on 20, which doesn't sound a lot, but we have got huge efficiencies um, in the office. It's all about efficiencies, I think, to keep your costs down. Um, but we see there's going to be a need to grow bums on seats. Uh, we have brought new tables, which gives us that growth. We can probably fit 40, maybe even 50 people in our office. Um, but we don't want clucking chickens. We, we actually want people that are personal and be able to offer that service that people really want still. Otherwise, it, we're no different from the big boys. Um, and I think if we can get commercial move, moving in the right direction before the end of this year, we would have achieved something in commercial. Do you think 2021 is going to be a good year economically for the world? Oh, it's a big question. It's um, a huge question. It is. I think there's been so much turmoil, people losing their jobs. There's still more people are going to lose their jobs. I think we're going to have another lockdown, um, possibly this year or even into next year, because it's the cold weather that drives the illness. Um, I really hope and pray that next year is a much better year for everybody. It's not just uh, financial, economic. I think that the, the world is on its knees at the moment because of it. Um, governments are doing what they can, where they can, how they can. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not saying anybody's done a great job or a bad job. I just think it's, it's a great learning curve for every nation about what this COVID illness can do. And, and there will be some in the future, not hopefully not for another 100 years, because they seem to happen every 100 years. Um, but we've got to learn to live with it and adapt to it. My sister read a book, and I wished I could remember the name of it. And if I do remember, I'll put it in the show notes for this podcast. But it basically predicted um, a global flu-like pandemic in 2020 and said it will go as quickly as it comes and it will come back with a vengeance in 2030. So I'll find the book. I'll put it in the show notes. And in 2030, let's revisit this podcast <laughs> <laughs> and see well, whether the predictions were... were... Uh, I, I, uh, I spend as little time as I can on Facebook, but there was something interested on there the other day saying that um, all the major viruses that have come into the UK happen every 100 years. So smallpox, um, the... the the um, thing that happened. Spanish flu. Yeah, all those type of things. You know, uh, we've had other illnesses and viruses in the last hundred years that in our age demographic, um, and they've come and gone. I don't think COVID is going to come and go. I think we'll have to adapt to it, as I said. Um, and I'm really hopeful that there will be some vaccination because it is killing too many people. Too many people have lost their jobs, which is sad. And, um, you know, it, people have got to embrace the change. If they do that, a lot of people are working from home where, where they can, which is fantastic. And that's added to the completely different dimension to insurers because, you know, they've never done that. They've all had to come into London or to where they work. And now they all work from home. It's just, it's just a different life now. And I, I actually, when it first happened, I was really scared and nervous about the business and just life in general. Um, but now I'm, as long as people keep themselves sensible and safe i think the country can go from strength to strength it just depends on how people react to it that silly people that go out into and mix in bigger circles does cause an issue and that's just what's happened now yeah i think so too and i do think um i do think there's a there's a change that's been coming for a while and covid's probably um fast forwarded it and uh yeah uh, there's sort of a new era coming which will be much more zoom enabled and probably much more efficient in a lot of ways for it a lot of the people i'm talking to are saying you know i, I really want to get back to the face-to-face -face client interviews but being able to do the touch points you know maybe doing that once a year rather than once a quarter it just frees up an awful lot of travel time and things like that 
No, it's a good excuse to have some beers with people. <laughs> I miss my beers. True. That's also <laughs> true. That is absolutely true. <laughs> so um, in terms of um, you guys, you said COVID gave some uh, problems for you guys, but you're coming out of it now, particularly around the BI stuff. Have you got any... Yeah. Um, is it, what what has it taught you as the director of or part of a you know the senior management team of an insurance broker? What has it taught you, and what sort of lessons could you give to other people that have also had a really crap time during this period? And <laughs> um, if anything, we've only had really apart from insurers not being able to get deals done quickly, which you know you can understand the reasons why behind that. We've had, we've had sort of two issues, really. One was knowing how staff work from home is the big thing. I think when, it, when the lockdown first happened, there were, everybody worked from home. And I, I'm no different. Strange enough, my son, who is 18, I think he's an adult, but he still acts like a child. <laughs> I'd be nice to him, really. Um, he, Xbox, my daughter was home, who's 20, and she had a... Uh, uh, um, downloading movies, a phone on, their iPad on, it just drained the Wi-Fi. And we've never had an issue with the Wi-Fi until lockdown. Um, and getting stats, logging into the systems, we, we obviously, we, everyone, most people now can uh, re uh, access their system remotely. Um, it just caused me to have to look around the market to get a new Wi-Fi or stronger Wi-Fi. Um, it's been a bit of a godsend because it's kept my son from moaning about his Xbox, keep going, jumping out or going down, which is a good positive thing from my sanity point of view. Um, but I think overall, that, that's a big lesson. Staff here um, had huge Wi-Fi issues um, and we're telling them off for, um, why are you not working? Your figures are down, your call stats are down. Oh, it's my Wi-Fi. So no, they've actually even, we've told them if, you know, if, they've got to work they can, they can go unpaid they want to go on to some sort of furlough scheme with us um but we didn't make anybody furlough during the during the lockdown because we are still a service industry with not a lot of staff and um we lost a lot of money during lockdown um but they seem to appreciate that that was an issue for us which is good um but that's the big thing we have the lesson we learned is don't expect don't wait for the unexpected plan prepare understand things anything that we weren't ready for really was the wi-fi issue if i'm being brutally honest um, from a company point of view um you you really need to have strict processes in place and people ready to do those processes to make sure your business continues it's different in all different types of industries but insurance wise if your your biggest payday is your renewal book I don't mean that horribly. It's just a case that if you renew your renewals, you make money. If you don't renew them, you, you lose money. It's as simple as that. And your policy count drops. So you've got to be ready, got to have processes. People have got to understand what their role is in the big scheme of things. And you've got to have sort of people in the right management areas to be able to back you up and check staff are doing the job properly. And also making sure their mental welfare is looked after because I suffered during lockdown. I dare say a lot of people have suffered because you don't, you haven't, you've only got your family circle. You haven't got anybody else outside of that to give you other influences or different conversations. And I think that's, they're the lessons that we've learned. Plus obviously insurers closing their doors for about two months before you could uh, actually speak to them about pro progressing any scheme or deal that you were after. Yeah, it has been a really incredibly strange time and we've we had uh, Wi-Fi issues as well. So um, completely with you on that. And also, I agree with the process. That's a lot of what we do. Um, although we're sales and marketing, we're, we're actually strategic process embedding. So yeah. new business, what are your processes? How are you going to manage it? How are you going to measure it? Uh, and, and who's going to carry it out? And same Absolutely. with renewals and placement strategies and stuff. So completely agree with you on that. I think that's been a really, really helpful overview, Justin. Is there anything else you want to add? Any top tips for, for <laughs> brokers out there from your experience? No, be strong, be focused, be brave, go for it. Really, that's got to be the message. I love that. Go for it. Well, on that note, thank you ever so much for your time. Um, much thank appreciated. You. Thank you for your time.